Welcome to Downtown Sports. My name is Downtown Stephen Brown. And in today's video, guys, we're going to be talking about the series preview between the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Tampa Bay Lightning in the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. The first game of the series will be Monday night in Toronto as the Leafs do have home ice advantage in this series. But just to take care of some news and notes ahead of that game, yesterday on the 29th, Sheldon Keefe said in regards to their injured guys that they're not 100% sure whether or not they'll play in game one of the series, but they'll reevaluate Sunday and see where those guys are at. And I'm sure he's talking about Michael Bunting, Anze Kasha, and Rasmus Sandin as well, who was supposed to play on Friday, but didn't. In a previous video, we showed a video of Anze Kasha skating around and he was in a regular gray practice sweater, but on the 28th, he was back in non-contact red, and that's just the volatility of a concussion. One day it could be fine, the next day it's just not. But it is encouraging that he continues to skate. And they had him practicing on a line with William Nylander and Ilya Mikheyev. Nylander just filling in for John Tavares as it was a maintenance day for him. Chris Johnston was on TSN 1050 yesterday talking about the Maple Leafs injury situations. In regards to Michael Bunting, he said he's not 100% sure whether or not he's going to play in game one of the series against the Tampa Bay Lightning or not. But as we showed in a previous video here on the channel, he was skating the other day and putting all of his weight on one leg, transferring it to the other, and stick handling. And he continues to do activities like that. So it is encouraging ahead of game one, but uh, maybe we'll find out Sunday if he's going to play or not. But we could find out like Monday at 7 p.m. just as a stall tactic to kind of mess with John Cooper and the Tampa Bay Lightning. Now, Anze Kasha, like we already mentioned, CJ saying that he doesn't expect him to be ready for game one of the playoffs, but does expect him to be back during round one at some point, which would be a huge boost to the Toronto Maple Leafs lineup because Lance Kasha, whether you want to play him in uh, the top six on that line with Tavares and Mikheyev possibly, or on a shutdown line with Kampf and Engvall, um, he's a very versatile player and he's been missed from the Toronto lineup over the last little while. And Rasmus Sandin finally is close physically, but Chris Johnson saying that it'll take an injury to get him into the lineup. Something interesting to note is the possibility of going with 11 forwards and 7 defensemen. They did it in the game against the Boston Bruins yesterday, but they had a lot of guys out of the lineup and things were kind of jumbled all over the place. Wonder if Sheldon Keefe was just trying something in that game, because I've wondered at different points of this year whether or not they do it, especially after the trade deadline, because they do have more than 6 NHL defensemen. The fourth line for the Toronto Maple Leafs this year has been wildly inconsistent, especially after New Year's, but... Since the trade deadline, it's been a bit better with the addition of Colin Blackwell and guys like Kyle Clifford, Jason Spezza, and Wayne Simmons just playing better. But if you're remembering the last game that the Leafs played up against the Lightning, they lost 8-1, but Kyle Clifford and Wayne Simmons played very well in that game. Kyle Clifford had a few scoring opportunities, Wayne Simmons had his thing with Pat Maroon, and Kyle Clifford even took care of Corey Perry at one point. I just, I don't want to deal with those two guys' antics going unchecked through a seven game series. And even though you probably don't play a fourth line with Clifford and Simmons on it very much, or just one of those guys, um, I, Kyle Clifford bonking Corey Perry over the head with the stick there to just keep him in check, you know, dealing with a guy like Pat Maroon. Those are things that only those guys can do. But as Nick points out here, leaving Rasmus Sandin in the press box feels wrong just because of how good he's been this year and the steps in his development that he's taken, it feels like he's ready to take on more than just a third pair role. I don't know how much more, but he was excellent this year before going down with an injury. And I think a lot of people are forgetting just how good he was. I'm not a huge fan of going 11 and 7 and disrupting things. I'm not a huge fan of taking Kyle Clifford, Wayne Simmons, both or one of those guys out of the lineup. I'm also not a huge fan of leaving Rasmus Santin in the press box. You got to weigh the pros and the cons with these things. I'm leaning more towards just going 12 and 6 and Sandine sitting, but ah, it's not easy. But the one thing that I can say about it is that there's options and having options is a good thing. But David Alter pointed out the other day that Jake Muzzin is going into this year's playoffs not at 100%. And for a lot of people, um, that gets you frustrated. It gets you annoyed because basically going into every series or in every series since the Maple Leafs acquired him, Jake Muzzin's been hurt. Right from the get-go this year, it looked like Jake Muzzin was dealing with some lingering issues, either from last season or in years past. And then the two concussions this year, he's talked about being hesitant to play that physical game, the game that he needs to be effective. But 
In yesterday's game, he did lay a real big bruising hand. I can't remember who it was on, but it's nice to see Jake Muzzin doing Jake Muzzin things. And if he is confident to play that physical game and it's just some bumps and bruises, you can understand why the Maple Leafs are willing to roll the dice and let him play through it because just the season ago, Jake Muzzin was awesome for the Toronto Maple Leafs, playing very, very tough minutes up against all the other team's best players. Again, I'm not a huge fan of going with 11 and 7, but you got to work with what you got. And maybe Muzzin going into a game, you know, he's less than 100%. Maybe he's at like 90, let's just say. But he tweaks something and now he's at like 80 or 75 or something. You know, do you sit him out? Do you play him hurt against the Tampa Bay Lightning? Do you really have to want to worry about that? I mean, we know the pros and the cons, but if you're going with 11 and 7, maybe you have an extra guy there, whether it's Justin Hall, Rasmus Sandin. No, I'd rather it be Rasmus Sandin. You can mix things up and change them on the fly. And for Rasmus Sandin, who's coming back from an injury, you know, if you're going with 11 and 7, you can play him in some more favorable matchups, get his legs under him, get his confidence back up to where it was before he got hurt. And like we said, this is a really good player to just leave on your bench. Something also to note about the lineup against the Bruins where the Maple Leafs went with 11 and 7, Justin Hall was the seventh guy. So if they do go with 12 and 6, I'd expect Justin Hall to sit. Moving on from the lineup and looking at where these two teams stack up in terms of the advanced numbers, we will talk about uh, strategy and break down how these two teams play and how the last couple of games have gone a little bit later. But in terms of the advanced numbers, offensively, defensively, they favor the Toronto Maple Leafs. But anyone looking at this series on paper can point out um, the, the, the discrepancy in goal between Andre Vasilevsky and Jack Campbell. There is an angle to play if you want to be optimistic about the goaltending and Jack Campbell, though. His first 20 games of the year, he had a 942 save percentage and was absolutely unbeatable. But in that game on December the 4th against the Minnesota Wild, he got run into really, really hard. And when they first announced that he had a rib injury, they said it wasn't something that was bothering him for a longer period of time. But the stats say something otherwise. But after that game against the Minnesota Wild, until they held him out with a rib injury in 20 games, he had an 885 save percentage. It really is the tale of two goalies with Jack Campbell this year. But like we showed in the sample before that, he had a save percentage over like 940. And if you want to go back even further, um, from like March to 20th of last season throughout the playoffs, uh, up to that Minnesota Wild game, he played in 45 out of the team's last 56 games and had a save percentage of well over 930. So it's like, what goalie do you think is going to show up here? Since coming back from injury, he's 7-0-2 with a 915 save percentage, and that includes a performance where he stopped 32 out of 34 against the Tampa Bay Lightning earlier on in April. How much faith you have in Jack Campbell is going to depend on you. For me, I'm really not too sure what to think. Is he this 915 goalie? Is he what we saw throughout the middle of this year? I mean, I was just speculating when I said that, hey, maybe that injury occurred uh, or first happened in that game against the Minnesota Wild because he got run into really hard and was slow to get up. I, I forget. I think it was Marcus Foligno who ran into him. They they said that the injury happened a couple of weeks afterwards and it wasn't bothering him for a long time. Is he the goalie that we saw going back to last year through the playoffs into the beginning of the December before the numbers took a nosedive and he had over a 930 save percentage playing in 45 out of the team's last 56 games? Did he just need a break? I don't know. But if you're a Maple Leafs fan... Uh, Jack Campbell versus Andre Vasilevsky. <laughs> Even if Jack Campbell is what he was to start this season, he could still end up being the second best goalie in this series. If you're looking at how the Maple Leafs have played versus the Tampa Bay Lightning this year, I'm going to put a little bit of an asterisk beside this because when I looked up the numbers, Natural Statrix said that they only played three games against the Lightning, but I know for a fact that it was four. But when I looked at the actual numbers, they seem to add up. So maybe it's just a glitch going on with their website with the games played counter or whatever. But they split the four games two to two. But in terms of the shot attempt share, the actual shots, the expected goals for the scoring opportunities and the high danger shot attempts, the Maple Leafs controlled the majority of all of them. The game that the Leafs lost eight to one to the Lightning. There was no Matthews. There was no Campbell. They were missing a couple of other players. It was towards the end of April, they had played a lot of games and a lot of games on the road and back-to-backs as well. Tampa played a lot of games as well, but most of them were at home. 
And if you're looking at the game that the Leafs beat them 6-2, to two, that was Tampa's third game in four nights. You can poke holes in either of those very convincing wins. But the other games on the season were fairly close. They did favor the Lightning a little bit. Um, but overall, like I said, this series is going to be very, very close, except, except, um, the goaltending. The goal, the goaltending has the chance to just sway this way in favor of the Lightning. Another thing to look at here is how these teams have played against other playoff teams this year. And the Maple Leafs have a 23, 10 and five record against teams who made the playoffs this year. And the Lightning, 18, 15 and six. Not as good. So they've gotten a lot more of their points against the bottom feeder teams where the Leafs have blown games against them. I mean, if they would have just beaten Buffalo and Montreal, they probably could have won the President's Trophy this year. But it is what it is. If you're looking at the Maple Leafs and their scoring leaders, Matthews with 60 goals and 106 points in 73 games. Marner with 97 points in 72 games. I think that those two guys play very well for the Leafs and have a big series. That's They've added layers to their game offensively this year where they are the first guy on the, in on the four check. They are getting in in front of the net and scoring those greasy goals. I think that they're going to have a big series for the Leafs. They almost have three guys who are a point per game. They have six 20-plus goal scorers on their team. And if you're looking at their big deadline acquisition, it's Mark Giordano who's got 12 points in 20 games with the team. That's almost a 50-point pace for a defenseman, and he's played well defensively as well. The Maple Leafs do have depth on this team. Their big guys have had incredible years, uh, years where they've developed and gotten even better. I like their team. If you're looking at the Lightning scoring leader, Steven Samko's having an amazing season, 106 points, over 40 goals for him. They would have had three guys blow past the point-per-game mark if Kucherov would have played the whole season. They also have six guys with 20-plus goals, and they've gotten a lot of scoring from their depth players including Nick Paul, who they picked up at the trade deadline from the Ottawa Senators with 14 points in 21 games for them. A guy like Brandon Hagel, who they spent a lot on, hasn't necessarily produced a lot for them. Um, I know that they're, they were trying to recreate that third line that they had last season of uh, Blake Coleman, Barclay Goudreau, and Yanni Gord, and it hasn't necessarily worked out for them, but they got a hell of a team. And if you're looking at the lineup that they rolled out in their last game of the season against the New York Islanders, they don't really have any injuries. Jan Ruda, who normally plays with Victor Hedman, is out. The Leafs absolutely torched him in that 6-2 win. Um, but the, the lineup looks real strong. Stylistically, these teams defend basically the same way, at least in terms of the neutral zone four check, where both teams feature a 1-1-3. One, one, and the design of this system is to sort of play traffic cop to one side. You're going to see the three back players are going to try to funnel the puck carrier to one side of the ice, and they're either going to try to cut that player off with a two-on-one matchup or force that player to dump it into the weak side and make something happen. And really, if you're watching the last two games that these two teams have played against each other, um, in the game where Toronto beat Tampa 6-2, to two, um, they burned them with speed. And if you're looking at the game where Tampa beat the Leafs 8-1, to one, they burned them with speed. And also, Ju J Justin Hall had himself a game in that 8-1 to one loss. I watched the extended highlights from both of those games, and oh my god, Justin Hall was bad. He was really, really bad in that game against the Lightning. If you want to watch the extended highlights for yourself, I'll leave those links in the description of the video. But something else to note from that 8-1 to one loss the Maple Leafs got caught in their own zone a couple of times, just being too soft in front of their net, not tying up sticks. And I'm sorry, sir, NHL players, uh, if you give them enough time and space in front of your net, and you leave their stick wide open. They're going to be able to make a skilled play and deflect the puck. And for your goalie, I mean, what are you, what are you really going to do at that point? What made the Leafs so successful in that 6-2 to two win over the Tampa Bay Lightning is they were burning them with their speed all game long and with their puck movement as well. They were getting the puck up ice before the Lightning can get set in their neutral zone defense and they were burning them with their speed as well. At one point, I even saw the Lightning using a 1-3-1, which is a neutral zone trap to try to slow the Maple Leafs down, but the Maple Leafs have added a layer to their game this year. Their star players are not afraid to dump the puck in and win it back. Oftentimes you see Matthews Marner, they're the first guy in on the four check and they can win it back. And that's what they were doing in that game so that 
adjustment that John Cooper made in that game did not work at all. The Maple Leafs just continued to walk all over them. And in that 8-1 to loss, it was the complete opposite, where Tampa Bay was getting the puck up ice quick before the Maple Leafs can get set in their neutral zone defense, and they were burning them with their speed and in zone as well. The Maple Leafs just, like I said, were not tough enough on tying up the sticks of the Tampa Bay players or in front of their net. This is going to be a real back and forth series, and I think you're going to see a lot of similar goals between both teams. And because he's evil, Dom from The Athletic has the Maple Leafs as 62% favorite over the Tampa Bay Lightning in this series. I just, I, 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 I don't feel comfortable with that at all. Like we said, both teams offensively, defensively, in terms of the advanced numbers this season, very similar. The Maple Leafs have the better record against playoff teams this year, but the Lightning have Andre Vasilevsky. Uh, you know, if you're looking for an X factor in a series, that's one thing that the Lightning have and the Leafs don't. But then again, we talked about Jack Campbell. I don't really know what to expect from it. Maybe some of you are more confident in it um, than I am or more than I'm just willing to be. I mean, I want to believe that he can play well, of course. <sighs> I framed the biggest question in this series so far in this video to be Jack Campbell. I'd be stupid to not talk about Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner. Are the big guns on this team going to show up? And like I was talking a little bit earlier on, that 6-2 to two win over the Lightning, I mentioned it. This year, you see the Maple Leafs' best players, and I'm talking about Matthews and Marner. Um, sometimes they are the first players in on the floor check. They do grind behind the net. They do get into those nitty-gritty areas in front of the net. They are scoring in different ways. They've added layers to their game offensively. I don't think that those guys get shut down. I think that Matthews has a big, big series. But I I can't give I can't do a series preview without giving a prediction. And I mean, man, I'm confident in saying that Matthews is going to have a big series. I'm confident in saying that Marner is going to have a big series. For me, I can't I can't get past the goaltending. For me, if Jack Campbell plays well, I think that the Leafs are going to win. I really do believe that. And I'm going to define well by saying like 9-15 and above. If he doesn't hit that, I have a hard time believing that this series gets past five games. Andre Vasilevsky is that good. I know that that's a cop-out, and I'm sorry. I mean, I am confident in Matthews and Marner having a big series. But with Jack Campbell, I just, I don't know. If he plays well in game one and they win game one, for me, even if the series does go seven games, because that that good game one performance, um, I'll be more confident in that game seven. But I don't know. I guess we're just going to have to wait and see for Monday. As always, guys, make sure to like the video if you did like it and subscribe for more because more is always on the way. I guess we'll see.